Your driver was struck by lightning in the parking lot. I give this speech at a Rotary Club, and a guy comes up afterwards and says, a friend of mine's got a BMW he wants to sell. I said, well, okay. Would you help him determine the value? I said, sure. But I said, I'm not interested in a BMW. I don't need a sedan or a coupe. I'm, I'm all right. He says, okay. So I call the guy up, and I said, I understand you have a BMW you want to sell. He was in Virginia. And he says, yeah. I said, well, tell me what the model is. I'll give you an idea of what it's worth. I said, I'm not really interested in it. He says, it's an M1. I said, well, you just redefine this deal here. <laughs> I, I always like the M1. And so we do a deal on the phone, and I violate every rule of buying a car. I fly to Virginia. I get there at 7 o'clock at night. It's pouring rain, and the car's had a color change. And we go to dinner, and the guy says, I don't have the title yet. It's coming in this week. And I had a cashier's check for the car. Well, he was wearing a rotary pen, and I was a Rotarian. I said, okay, I'm going to trust you with this. Here's the check. I'm going to take the car home. My friend Bob Snodgrass at Brumo said, that's the dumbest thing you've ever done in your life. I said, I trusted the guy. He was a Rotarian. So it was all right. I got the car. So my banker says, he spotted me the money until I could sell something else to pay for it. He says, what's this car you bought? I said, it's called a BMW M1. What's it look like? I said, oh, sports car. I said, well, come on by when you get it. Let's go get a sandwich. So I pull up in front of the bank. And I'm getting out of the car. It's white. Some guy says, is that a Ferrari? I said, no, it's a BMW. He says, I've never seen one like that. I said, it's pretty rare. So he gets in the car and we drive to a sandwich shop. We're getting out. Some guy looks and says, is that a Lotus? I said, no, no, it's a BMW. Yeah, I've never seen one like that. I said, it's, it's pretty rare. So I'm going home at night and I stop at a traffic light on San Jose Boulevard. And this guy pulls up, runs his window down and says, hey, man, is that a Pantera? I said, no, it's a BMW. He said, I've never seen one like that. I said, it's pretty rare. So I pick up my wife, and we decide to go get a hamburger at Hooters, which was near our house. We get in the M1, we go up, pull up to the railing, and one of the little hoodettes was out there on the porch. She looks down and says, wow, an M1. <laughs> I said, you're the only one in town knows what it is. She says, yeah, man, I got a poster of one hanging up on my wall at home. So I finally, the car was originally henna red, and the guy who owned it got tired of saying, no, it's not a Ferrari, so he painted it white. So I went back to henna red, and one day I pull in a Shell station, I'm fueling it up, and the guy says, how come this Ferrari has all these BMW medallions on it? I said, well, there's a good reason for it, because it's a BMW. Well, I've never seen one like that. It's pretty rare. So that was the pretty rare car. You know, they, they didn't have a lot of horsepower. It was like 277 horsepower uh, out of the factory. But it, it was like a really high-end kit car. There were panels that were pop riveted on it. They, they went to the parts box, you know, the 328, six series taillights, 328 instrument cluster. It wasn't a bad car. It just wasn't a great car. I had it about 10 years, and that's when I lost money on. Uh, if I'd have kept it another five years, I uh, probably would have tripled my money. It just, it was in a dead spot at that time. I, I have this idea about value. It's a bell curve. It starts off, it goes up, it comes down, mostly. There's some that go up and keep going. But most cars, when a guy is 20, he's down here. And he has his eye on a car. When he gets to 40, he's made a little money. He's put on a little weight. He wants to recapture his youth. So he's looking at that car he saw when he was 20. And so are other people. So the value goes up. And somewhere it crests. And when he gets to be about 70 or 80 years old, let's say he bought something here at 30, and now it's worth a half a million, he's looking to cash in. So now a lot of them come on the market, and the value starts coming down. I'm 76, so I'm over the top of that curve. And uh, like my 57 Eldorado convertible, I love it. It's Bahama blue with a blue metallic leather interior. It is as big as the Queen Mary with the tail fins. And they were selling for about 250 five years ago. They're down around a buck and a quarter now because it's on the downhill side of that curve. The guy who, who remembers doesn't remember it. That's a car he doesn't relate to. The M1? It had little quirks. For example, the uh, the tray under the air conditioning condenser would plug with uh, bugs that would grow in it. And then you'd go around a right-hand corner and it would dump cold water on your, your accelerator foot. Or you'd go around a left-hand corner and it'd dump cold water on your passengers. And then if you didn't drive them a lot, 
it built up corrosion in the distributor caps. You have to take the cap off. Or if you needed to replace the cap, it was uh, Morelli. And they only did a production run once every three years. So you'd have to buy two caps, keep one on the shelf. It would eat water pumps. And if you wanted to buy a water pump because M1 wasn't built for the U.S. market, and you went to a U.S. supplier, you give them the part number, and they knew you had an M1, so a water pump that would cost normally 280 bucks on a six series car is suddenly $1,500 because the shaft's a little shorter because it's mid-engine and they're trying to clear the firewall. So there were little idiosyncrasies about the car and, and they, the ignition boxes, which were Morelli, which were similar to the Ferrari, they had a tendency to go bad. When they did, you had to send them back to Germany or Italy and get them rebuilt. So you had the distributor caps, you had the ignition boxes, you had the air conditioning unit, you had the kit car feeling of it. It, it handled good for a mid-engine car. It was very good, but uh, not a great car. Uh, I found out there's a Worth makes a, an ignition oil that if you spray it on the inside of the cap, that problem went away. Air filters, if you bought them here in the United States, $300. If you found somebody in Germany who would get you one, 65 because the car wasn't made for the U.S. market. The only thing is, like I say, it being mid-engine cab forward, your, your legs are kind of off to the right. It was a usable car. You know, you could drive it every day. You could throw luggage in it. You could take a trip in it. You know, that car had a kind of a checkered beginning. Uh, BMW designed a car. They decided they didn't have a production facility small enough to do it, so they contracted with Lamborghini to build a car. Lamborghini was going broke at that time. And they got no bad deals. And BMW had the bodies done in Italy and shipped to Bauer in Germany when Bauer assembled the cars. So by the time it got to market, it was an older car. And they built it for Group 4 racing. You know, they had to build 400 of them to qualify for Group 4 racing. Well, they built 400. But by the time it qualified for Group 4 racing, Porsche was coming out with the 930, 934, and the game was over. So then they did the Pro Car Series where they took identical M1s and supported, it was a support race at the Formula One races. They would put Nicky Lauda, uh, Mario Andretti, they put all these famous drivers in and do a support race at the Formula One because they didn't have any other place to race the car. It was not competitive. Uh, my friend Dave Cowart, who I've had a lot of fun with at Hershey area, he had the Red Lobster M1. And uh, they won the GTO championship at IMSA with it, but it was because they were persistent. And uh, the year after they won it, of course, the game was over with Porsche. Let's see, the streetcar was 277 horsepower. The pro cars were pretty close to 400 horsepower. And then they did uh, a turbocharged version that ran uh, in Europe. Uh, I think they did one or two of those. And then uh, one of them, uh, Bruce Jenner, Caitlyn Jenner, whatever Jenner, uh, drove one at Daytona, Rusty Jones car, and they dropped a Chevy engine in it eventually. You know, the Chevrolet small block engine is probably one of the true automotive engineering masterpieces of all times. Oh, one other car I, I have, I, f I forgot to mention, Jack Baldwin and I, uh, drove, uh, with Charlie McCarthy, uh, drove at the Watkins Glen 24-hour in a Chevy Camaro, a prototype 1LE, built by Bill Mitchell, and uh, I was able to buy that car back. I don't know what I'm going to do with it. You know, it's, it, there's no place to race it, but it, it, it it was uh, another story. Uh, I was racing with uh, Charlie McCarthy and his son, Charlie Jr. We were at Watkins Glen. Charlie Sr. starts in a car and it's pouring rain. I mean, it is just coming down like a Florida monsoon. And uh, young Charlie, just before the rain starts, I'm going out the car and get my jacket. So he leaves. And Charlie used to be an offshore boat racer, so instead of having the normal racing radios, we had the boat radios with a big fiberglass antenna in the pits. And I'm wired to it. And all of a sudden, there's a oh, boom, a lightning strike. And I said, I said to Charlie, I said, look, I'm not going to sit here wired to this radio. If you want to talk to me, flash the lights. I'll turn it on, but I'm, I'm getting away from this. And young Charlie didn't come back. Oh, about 15 minutes later, somebody stuck their head in the pits. He says, is this car 39? I said, yeah, why? He says, your driver was struck by lightning in the parking lot. He's in the hospital, and he'd lost his sight and had third-degree burns across his body. He recovered and became a Catholic priest. <laughs> I think he got a message. <laughs> so his dad's in the car. His mother is up on the scoring stand, 
And she grabs the chief mechanic and runs off to the hospital. So I called Charlie on the radio and I said, uh, you got to come in. We got to do a tire change. Why? Right, everything's fine. No, 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 no. You, we mounted the wrong tires up. I didn't want to tell him what was going on. So he came in, get out of the car and said, you got to go to the hospital. And, and so the other crewman takes him. So there's one crewman, my son, Clay, and I. And we're in the first 30 minutes of a 24-hour race. Well, the rules say I can do two back-to-back -back stints, which would be four hours. So the rain goes away and the sun's coming out. And I'm about two hours into this stint. And I'm saying, well, what am I, I got to find someone else to drive with me. I mean, I, there's no one else in the pits. So I see Jack Baldwin who, from Atlanta, great driver, ran NASCAR, ran IROC series, Trans Am champ, good driver. His Camaro was offside the road, hood up. So I called my son on the radio. I said, find Jack Baldwin's pits and find out if he's out. And if he's out, will he come drive with me? And he, he went down and said, yeah, yeah, Jack, Jack will come drive. I said, okay. So we had started like 13th in the pouring rain, and we dropped down in the 40s in, in the field because we had to stop early. And Jack came over, and we hammered that car all night long. We didn't put a wheel wrong. He was always a second and a half faster than me, maybe two seconds. But we hammered, hammered, hammered. We didn't let anybody get in our way. And we wake up Sunday morning, we're fifth overall, you know, battling for fourth. We finished fifth. But uh, people ask me, what, what was your best race? I said, that one. I said, and that's not necessarily, I didn't win many races. I said, it's not races you, you win. It's where you felt you gave up all you could give. If you finish fifth, that, that's where you're going to finish. But I had a chance to buy that car back, you know, 15 grand. And it's perfect. It's, just, it's like it's brand new. You could eat off the underside of it. Had all the trick stuff, the aluminum drive shaft, the baffled gas tank, the radio delete, you know, all that stuff. And it sits in the warehouse. I take it out every now and then and drive it around. It's got straight exhaust, makes a lot of noise. But there's no other place to drive it, you know. Someday, there's enough of those Firehawk and uh, Escort cars that someone will put together a, a race for them. We'd like to thank Avalon King for their continued support of the VinWiki YouTube channel. From crazy projects like Casey's King Zero to shooting derelict AMG cars off of a cliff in Alaska, they're interested in a whole lot more with respect to the automotive hobby than just making our cars look great. But their ceramic coating is awesome and you can get it with for $25 off at the link in the description below. So be sure to check it out, try it on your car, let us know what you think in the comments and let them continue to support idiots like us.